Good morning and welcome to our online service. Before we get started today, we just have a few announcements. There are many ways that you can stay connected over the course of the week with For His Glory Ministry. We have daily devotions starting each day at 6 a.m. on Facebook. On Tuesdays, you can join us for The Chair, our weekly teaching. Join us every Wednesday for our online Bible study live on Facebook. And Sundays, you can join us for our online service, Truth in the Streets. Or to get everything around your busy schedule, download our free ministry app. We're going to start off today with a time of offering and then spend a few minutes worshiping our Lord, then dive right into today's sermon. But it is our prayer that this will be a community where you can come together, unify your faith, and become more like Jesus. We are so glad that you're here.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up
Good morning. How y'all doing out there today? So glad to be joining you today. So glad to be here on this second Sunday of Advent. And I'm very excited to be giving you a word today 
focused on what the second Sunday of Advent is focusing on, love. Maybe that is uh, an estranged word for you today. Maybe you have not had any luck at love, but we're going to be looking at specifically God's love and praying that the Holy Spirit is going to realign our hearts back to God's original design and his original purpose for each one of us so that we truly know without a doubt that we are loved and focus on why Jesus came in the first place. And that was because of God's love. We're going to be lighting our second candle this morning and looking at the greatest love verse ever, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to, to condemn the world, but that the world through his might, through him might be saved. The promise of the Lord Jesus coming to rescue us brought light into the world and ignited hope. And we are going to be lighting this candle right now to exemplify that light of hope and love and turn our eyes to those things. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to come together as a body of believers and learn more about you. So I thank you, Father, for this time. I thank you, Holy Spirit. We invite you into this place. Open up our hearts and our ears for what it is that you have each one of us, for each one of us. Anoint me, Holy Spirit, with a fresh anointing that I may speak your truth with love. Right now, in Jesus' name, we cancel the plans of the enemy. He is not allowed to work and move. We shut him down. We muzzle him. We pray that our technology works, that everything works, so that we're able to hear every word that you have for us. We love you and praise you and thank you and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was preparing for the sermon this week and the Lord gave me this visual imagery of something that I hadn't thought about for a really long time. And he took me back to my high school years for Valentine's Day. Now, I don't know if they're still doing this. This was in the 80s. But every year for Valentine's Day, the student council would go off to the local florist and get these five gallon buckets of all of these carnations, different colors, bring them back to the school, set them all up at a table. And for Valentine's Day, you could go up to this table and purchase carnations that you could write a little card on it. 25 cents a carnation. So four for a dollar. And you could send those carnations to your friends, to your boyfriend or girlfriend. And I remember that day, like it was yesterday, you're sitting in the classroom, you're sitting at your desk, you're, 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 te you're listening to the teacher, and all of a sudden that door opens, right? And there's the person delivering the carnations. And all of a sudden, no one's listening to the teacher anymore, and we're all focused on, well, who's gonna get that carnation? And in that moment, your everything is riding on whether or not you're going to get a flower. I remember looking around the room, you know, to the popular kids, and they had carefully displayed all of their carnations that they were already receiving from all of their friends. And in that moment, right, you are defining what love is. For my teenage self, love was getting a carnation. Love was seeing if someone else 
liked me enough or loved me enough to spend 25 cents on me and get me a flower. And as soon as the Lord reminded me of this, I was, I was right back, right back as that young girl, thinking that this is what love is, right? A 25 cent carnation. And I measured my worth in those moments. I measured what love was in those moments. Was this love? <laughs> Absolutely not. But I think in our culture, I think it's always been this way, right? We are looking with our physical eyes, weighing and measuring by what we experience in this physical world. And when you think about Valentine's Day, for instance, they call it the Hallmark, uh, the Hallmark Day, the the Hallmark Day because you want to go out and spend five, six, ten dollars on a card. And of course there's flowers and candy and chocolates and teddy bears. And it's just this grandiose holiday to make sure that you share with the person that you love how you're feeling about them by buying them something. And for a lot of people, holidays like Valentine's Day are hard because they don't have love. They don't have someone buying them those gifts. Love doesn't mean the same for them. We, me we weigh and measure love based on what we see from other people, based on what we have experienced from other people, and not all of our experiences have been pleasant. Not all of our experiences have been loving. The sad thing, the hard thing for all of us to recognize in that moment though, right? Is that all of us are broken. All of us are human. All of us fall short and make mistakes and sin. And all of us hurt other people. Oftentimes, we are hurting ourselves the most, right? All of the negative self-talk, the way we think about ourselves, the way that we allow the enemy to come in and tell us who we are, instead of remembering that we are the children of the Most High King. When you think about it, though, how it was originally designed for a child to come into the world and the first people that they encounter and experience is two loving parents. Two loving parents, a father and a mother, to show them love, to let them feel safe, to let them know what love is, what family is, what belonging is. But what about the children that are coming in to broken homes, broken families, broken people. Maybe they're not wanted. Maybe they're coming in to two uh, parents that don't really love each other and they're fighting all the time. Maybe they're stressed and what they show the child isn't love, but desperation, loneliness, not the kind of love that our Father in Heaven designed. So that child's first experience of family, first experience of love, is tainted. And that's what they know. Love is broken promises. Love is conditional. Love is anger and unreliability and demanding. Love is not love at all. Then they grow up and start a family of their own and all they know is what they've been shown. So we have another generation of, of love falling to the wayside 
and all we see is stress and anger and conditional and all of these things that now show this child what love is and they go on and they start their family and we see generation after generation after generation of people that don't know what love is and how it was designed by our father. Then we watch TV, we listen to the radio, we see the advertisements and we learn what love is based on what the world tells us. Love yourself, take care of yourself, soothe yourself, please yourself, buy for yourself, protect yourself. And we've gotten even further away from the true meaning of love. So the million dollar question today on the second Sunday of Advent, as we've lit the candle of love, is what is love? We've all experienced some form of it, some shape of it, maybe not the fullness of it. Maybe we haven't experienced it at all. Maybe today as you're watching, you said, Amy, I don't really know what love is. Maybe you, you do know, but I'm asking you to put aside those thoughts for a moment. Maybe you are in love right now, and I want you to put those thoughts aside for a moment. Or maybe, like I just said, you have never experienced love, and your idea of love is tainted. I want you to put those feelings aside for just a moment. I want to introduce you to a concept of love that hopefully you've never heard of before. And if you have, I want to reignite that love in your hearts. A love that is unconditional. A love that is so grand it transcends time and space, meaning we cannot measure this love. We cannot put it on a scale. We cannot comprehend how big it is. We cannot comprehend how massive it is, but it's there. It's so grand that you can't even comprehend the size, the shape, or the feel of this love. So to further explain, I, I want you to think about this king. I want you to think about this king. And he was so great and so powerful and so mighty and so loved that angels saying about him, angels saying for him, angels saying to him all day long, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This king lived in the most beautiful place, perfect weather all the time, which is wonderful for people like us who live in Michigan and we have all the seasons and right now it's very cold. So I would love the idea of perfect weather all the time. He could have anything he wanted. He was the king. He could do anything he wanted. He had created the heavens and this thing called earth. And the earth was magnificent. He had designed it to be self-sufficient. It had seasons, waters, mountains, valleys. It had vegetation that would grow and, and reseed itself. It had animals and birds and the most beautiful creatures. But most importantly, it was filled with his children. Children that he had created and designed in his image to know him, to love him, to be in community with him. 
This love was uncompromising and included plans for their lives, beautiful plans, not to harm them, but to prosper them, plans for a beautiful hope and future. Plans that were all part of this beautiful tapestry that would work together for all the people. Not just one group over here or one group over here or for this color over here and this color over here. No, it was for all the people working together, loving each other. This was his original design to be in community with his children and his people and to be able to show them his love and for them to love each other in the purest forms, love, joy, peace, respect, unconditional love. And like every story, right, we have an enemy some dark creature that comes in and tries to destroy all the good stuff going on in the kingdom. So we have this angel of God, this angel of God, one that used to lead these beautiful songs, singing to the king. He decided that he wanted to do stuff on his own. He wanted to do his own thing. And he didn't like that God had created his children in his own image. He didn't like that he gave them the world to have dominion and authority. He wanted all of the attention. He wanted to be like God. So he gathered up a third of his cohorts, a third of his fellow angels that believed like he did. And he revolted against the king. But the king, because he was so mighty and so powerful, he cast those angels out of heaven and they were never allowed to return. And the battle begins. Fast forward and this enemy, the devil, has infiltrated a serpent deceived Eve and Adam, God's children, and broke into the world. And sin comes on the scene in the Garden of Eden. Sin, the state of human nature in which the self, the self is estranged from God. And from this we get self-assurance, self-image, self-justification, self-motivation, self-love. This was not God's original plan. This was not God's design. So what did the king do? From that exact moment when sin entered the world and Adam and Eve took the bite from the apple, God, the king, already started this thing in place, this design, this beautiful idea that he put into motion to restore the earth, to restore mankind, to, dis to restore his people. Back to the original design, back to where he could be in community with his people because he loved them and he wanted them to know this love. So generation after generation after generation happened, 77 generations from Adam and Eve Luke draws this imagery out in his gospel. The king using broken people to come together at the exact moment where he could show his love for the entire world. So what did the king do? 
He left his kingdom. He left his throne. He left the ability to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. He left the singing, the choirs of angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He left the beautiful, perfect weather. He left his kingdom and his mansion and his throne. And he came into the world as a baby, immaculately conceived by a young virgin mother into the messiness of this world, this broken world. He was born in a barn, in a manger, in the dirtiest places, to a virgin mother from one of the poorest towns, Nazareth. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. He left the perfection of his kingdom to come to this world, fully God, fully man, with one purpose, one purpose. He came to die on a cross to forgive my sins and your sins, your neighbor's sins, your enemy's sins, Who is this king? It's Jesus. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our Father loved this world so much that he sent his one and only Son to this world to take away the sin of the world, to die on a cross, to cancel the plans of the enemy, to show people what love really is and how to walk that out every single day. To die to self, to forgive our enemies, to be the light of the world and to love each other. Love. When I think about this kind of love and everything that God went through to show us this love, I want to lay down all of my 25 cent carnations. I wish I could go back to that day when I was sitting in the classroom waiting for a carnation from someone and I would have sat there confidently knowing that I'm loved. Knowing that it doesn't matter that my parents got a divorce. It doesn't matter that those things happened in my family. It doesn't matter that I struggled to know who I was. None of that mattered. What mattered is that God loved me, that he loves me today. And this is the trap that we fall into when we measure love by the, the things of this world, by the carnations and the teddy bears and the chocolate and the rings and the houses and every way we measure love. When I think about this kind of love, God wants to take me by the hand and walk me through this beautiful garden of roses. Not carnations, but roses. And he doesn't want to just give me one carnation. He wants to give me mile after mile after mile after mile of roses. Beautiful roses. These roses remind me of the beauty that he can make from the ashes of our lives and the color of the blood that he shed on the cross. I'm so often looking for a 25 cent carnation when God the Father is standing before me saying, I want to give you everything. And I did give you everything in my son. This kind of love that can light up this dark world and destroy the works 
of the enemy and I've seen it happen. He's done it in my own life. He's cast the enemy down and I've been completely whole and healed and transformed and renewed and I'm no longer that old person, that sinner that focused on myself, focused on my illness, focused on my brokenness, but I stand before you today redeemed and restored and only Jesus can do that. I love that his love is so great that he promises to come back again and take us home to our eternal home in heaven where we can live with him in his kingdom forever and ever. That Love supersedes all kinds of love. Any kind of love that we could try and experience here on this earth with broken people. This kind of love that Jesus offers us is infectious. It's contagious. It's life-changing. And it's available for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter where you've been or where you've come from or who you've tried to love in the past. This is available for everyone today, right now, at this moment. But we need to stop looking to the world. We need to stop sitting at our desks waiting for that 25 cent carnation to walk in the door and fix everything. We need to stop weighing and measuring love based on broken people and broken circumstances. We need to stop looking at love and how the world depicts it. We need to remember this true story of God's original design and what he went through and what he did to restore us back to himself. We were designed to be loved. We were created to be loved. We were created to be cherished by a father who knows every hair on your head, who knows everything about you. By a father who has great plans for each one of us. A father who fits perfectly right here. And nothing else will fill this God-shaped hole that you have right here. Nothing. Maybe you have been trying and you've been trying to fill that space up with money or with drugs, or with alcohol, or with other people, or with sex, or with whatever this world offers you in this fleeting moment to fill the hole that you are trying to fill. And each and every day, all you feel is more and more empty, and more and more unloved. This is why we're here today, all of us. We're here because God loves us. We're here because he sent his son into the world, born at Christmas, to give us the ultimate gift of love. The enemy is going to try and distract you this season. He's going to distract you with all the ways of the world and all the reasons you should be celebrating, right? To go out and get a Christmas tree and to buy presents and to buy the food and to decorate and to go shopping and to go to the parties and do the parades and do all the things. And he's going to try and distract you away from how much God really loves you and the devil's going to put a name tag on it and a, and a price tag on it and he's going to say, you're only worth this much. I'm here to tell you today that you were worth everything to God. 
And he showed that to all of us by sending his son, not just to come into the world, to be born, to be Emmanuel, God with us. But he loved us enough. He loved you enough to die on a cross, to take on all the sin of the world, your sin, my sin, past sin, future sin, all of the sin. It wasn't the nails that held him there. It was our sin. He did that because he loves us and he loves you and he wants you to remember that today. This is what Christmas is all about. It's about love, his love for you, his love for me, his love for the world. Amen. Let's pray. We sit in this moment, Lord, with this new perception, this inspired, ignited perception of love. And we sit in it for a moment and we take it in and we receive it and we say thank you. And it's one thing to hear a message about love and another to go out and walk it out every single day. And so I'm asking, Lord, for you to reveal yourself to each and every person listening, that they may experience and feel your love in a real and tangible way. And I pray in that moment when they do, that they will fully invite you in to work and to move to the fullness of what you want to give them, Lord. So that it's overflowing, so that they've never experienced anything like it before and never will again. Your perfect love. And as we move through this season, preparing our hearts for celebrating Christmas, I pray that each week you will reignite the passion inside of us, Lord, to prepare the way to get ready to receive the goodness and all of the gifts that you have for us, especially the gift of Jesus. We ask that you help us with the distractions and the moments that were detoured and that we can fully focus our attention and seek your kingdom first, your kingdom first. I pray for anyone out there that needs healing, Lord. I pray that you will heal them in Jesus' name. I pray for anyone out there that needs provision, that you will provide for them in Jesus' name. I pray for marriages to be restored. I pray for families to be reunited. I pray for families to come together and celebrate love. And that we die to self, we die to the selfishness, we die to the self-preservation, we die to that self-love that the world tries to sell us. And that we grab on to Jesus and focus our attentions and our eyes and our hearts on him. Thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Help us to stay focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to leave you with one final video today to kind of wrap this all up with a red bow. The wonder of his love. I want you to know how much he loves you. I want you to hold on to that this week. Put aside what the world tells you and focus on these words and how much God loves you. But thank you. Thank you so much for being here today and for joining us. I look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, until we can be together again, be blessed. You are not alone. That's what Jesus came to tell you. 
this ancient story of a scared yet hopeful mother, a savior king swaddled in a manger, noble stargazing pilgrims, lowly shepherds and glorious hosts of heaven filling the night sky to announce, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Every word is about how God longs to be with us. In the noise that we create because we're afraid of the silence, God comes with one word, love. And if you'll stop and listen, you'll hear Him calling your name. He is a personal God. He became one of us to prove it. It seems like it's too good to be true. But God, who created all things, created you for love. He created you for joy. And this joy, the joy you long for, and this love, the love you struggle to receive, it's here, now, waiting. But will you let yourself hope? Will you let yourself dream? Will you let yourself wonder at the glory of God who came to dwell among us? Because God is in the business of exceeding expectations and redeeming stories. He takes small beginnings and makes them into more than we could have ever asked. That's what He did by coming as a helpless baby in a manger, and that is exactly what He promises to do with you. And this is the wonder of His love.